So it's a long title. And those of you who are familiar with the theory of quadratic forms might think it'll be a very short talk because there's not too much to say about this. But I'll try to convince you that there is actually. Um, so let me introduce some notation, first of all. So let S be a three by three uh, symmetric matrix. So I'll write my ternary quadratic form in terms of S. So X will be a variable. These will usually be integers. And so I'll let S of X be the quadratic form associated to S. So um, this guy, and I'll assume that it's non-singular, so the determinant's not zero. So I'll call that capital D, and I'll assume it's positive. When you're dealing with ternary forms, it doesn't, the, the sign of the determinant doesn't really matter because you can just multiply S by minus one. Now, um, if you're talking about, it's a, a more modern way to do this would be to talk about um, uh, lattices and um, quadratic spaces, in which case, you know, the, the S would be a, a matrix of um, inner products of basis elements and changes of variables would be encoded in uh, changing the matrix. But for what I'm gonna do, it's more convenient for me to actually use matrices even though it's more elegant actually to, to not do that. But anyway, um, so S and S prime, two different matrices are in the same class or equivalent um, if you can transform one to the other. And I, I'm gonna use GL equivalents. This turns out to be, I'm, I'm gonna be using Ziegel's work. So this, this kind of constrained me in a lot of ways. Um, and this is the most natural thing if, uh, for what I'm going to be doing. So it means that there exists an A in GL3Z such that uh, A transpose S A is equal to S prime. So this corresponds to a change of basis. But I'll say that they're in the same class. And then in the same genus, if this happens over um, all primes, including infinity. And it turns out that there's only finitely many classes in a genus. So we assume that A, and the nice way to put it is to say that A is in GL3ZP, piatic integers uh, for all P including infinity. And what that means is we're talking about GL3R in that case. So this is a weaker condition for, you know, if you have an individual prime, if, if they're in the same class, they're kind of obviously in the same ZP class. And, if, and actually they're in the same genus if they're in the same class, but not necessarily in the other direction. However, there are only finitely many classes in a genus. This is a theorem. Uh, now, the Hasse principle, well, okay, so first of all, we, we have a notion of isotropy. So um, S is said to be isotropic over Z, say, if you can find a zero of it, if there exists a primitive, meaning the GCD is one, such that S of X equals zero. Okay, so this is you know a very um, well-studied thing. And one of the early, ca early cases of the Hasse principle says that S is isotropic if and only if it's uh, S X equals zero is solvable over ZP for all P. So S of X is isotropic if and only if it's this equation is solvable over ZP, non-trivially or primitively, if you like.
And I, again, you know, this is the, the opposite direction is, is um, if it's solvable over Z, it's obviously solvable over ZP, but the opposite direction is non-trivial. And that's the an early case of the Hasse principle. So uh, actually in this case, the Hasse principle is equivalent to a very classical result. It's one of the actually hardest cases to prove if you're talking about over Z. Um, it's a non-trivial result. It's equivalent to Lejeune's theorem. So it's a, it's a special case, it looks like. So this says that if I let S of X be diagonal, so AX one squared plus BX two squared, what, you know, one of the things that makes this question a lot easier is because we we're, we're talking about isotropy, the equation being zero, you you can have a rational solutions and and factor out the denominator. So it's really a question. It looks like it's completely a question about rational solvability, and which is why the Hasse principle is in effect here. But anyway, this allows you to reduce the Hasse principle to Lejeune's theorem, where in a special case where a, B, and C are integers, and you can assume that they're square-free. Their product is square-free, so they're relatively prime. And, you know, they, in order for them to be isotropic, it has to be indefinite, so they have to be different signs. But it, it, the Lejeune theorem says that this is isotropic. So if and only if you can make the, the local conditions into a very nice form. So minus a b minus a c minus b c, these have to be quadratic residues. Over the sort of obvious thing, so it's the opposite, the, the thing that's being left out. Um, Okay, so that's famous Lejeune theorem. Everybody's heard of this. And they also have to be not the same sign, A, B, C, not the same sign. So it's not trivial to see that this is equivalent to Hasse principle in general, you know, for a general ternary, but it's not too, it's not really hard either. By the way, there's a, you're probably aware of this book by Andre Vey on the history of number theory. I think it's just called number theory, but it's really a beautiful book because he, he mixes the history with, you know, modern explanations of the results. So it's a great place to, to learn about this if you if you want to see it. So I think it's just number theory. It's not the basic number theory, but number theory. It's really a history book. Okay. Um, now, uh, so again, you might think, okay, this is, is, this, is this the end of the story? Because we have a complete understanding of when a ternary quadratic form represents zero. Well, I, I want to convince you it's not the end of the story because what you you can also look at um, orbits of solutions, and there's a lot of interesting questions about orbits of solutions. So look at orbits. Well, what kind of orbits? Well, the maybe the first way to look at it is to think about orbits under automorphs of the of the quadratic form. So let me say that, um, so let me, let me denote capital C of X, capital C of S, sorry, to be, so these are the primitive solutions. Primitive with, S of X equal to zero. So these are the these are the solutions that we're interested in. Um, now suppose you have two solutions. Then they're in the same orbit. If you can go from one to the other using an automorph. So I'll just write out what that means. So if there is an A in GL3Z. It first of all takes um, x to x prime 
and is preserved and preserves S. So it's an automorph of S or isometry, however you want to look at it. So this splits up the solutions, assuming that they exist, into orbits, and there's actually finitely many. This is a theorem. I mean, this is a classical result too. Um, it's in, true in much greater generality. Um, so there are finitely many orbits. Z orbits, maybe I'll say Z orbit. And I'll denote that by little c of s. Okay, now um, you could be interested in how many orbits there are. And it's a non-trivial question. It's not obvious at all um, how many orbits there would be. And I'll, you'll see why, I guess, eventually. But you can also look at um, the orbits over the piatic integers. So the parallel question. So um, say that they're in the same ZP orbit. If the corresponding re relations hold. Or, you know, A, A and GL3 of ZP, including infinity. And again, there's only finitely many ZP orbits for each P. So let's CP of S be the number of ZP orbits. Okay, so the, the result I want to describe um, is the following. So given an S that we've been talking about, so for S non-singular ternary, There's a relation between the, the number of Z orbits and the number of ZP orbits. And it does involve the genus, which may not be consist of just one class. But the theorem is that if you sum over the genus, the forms in the same genus, and you take the, the, the number of orbits, the forms in the genus, that's the same thing as the product over the primes of the number of local orbits. And this is a finite product. So CP of S, it's usually one. Um, so it's not equal to one for most finitely many E. So this is a kind of a quantitative version of the Hasse principle. It's not exactly, it doesn't imply the Hasse principle as it's stated because the Haas principle would say that any S prime would be isotropic provided the right-hand side is not zero. But this is giving you um, a, a sort of, I, I would call the supplement of the Haas principle. So it tells you a bit more because it gives you some indication about how many orbits you have. Um, Excuse me, do you count the orbits with one over the size of the centralizer? No. So... That's the, so that leads me to the next comment because it looks like Ziegel's main theorem. Yeah. Form, because uh, Ziegel's main theorem has looks looks kind of like this, but it, for the sum over the genus, you would have um, measure of representation, um, which is basically a measure of the size of the isotropic group. Uh, mm -hmm. And on the right-hand side, you would have piatic product of piatic densities. So this is kind of a simpler version. It looks it looks similar, but it's actually simpler because these are all integers. Yeah, interesting. And, and there's no weighting going on at all. So mm -hmm. I got into this because I was reading Ziegel and he, there's some cases where his theorem doesn't apply. And this is one of them because the um, both sides of his identity are actually infinite in this case. So he didn't he didn't treat this case. And I got very curious as to what was going on here. And um, after many struggles and many sort of missteps, this is this had finally emerged as sort of a version of the Ziegel theorem. In a way, it kind of looks like Z it, it, you can think of it as being, if you know about Ziegel's theorem, it always has a mass formula embedded in it. And kind of what's happening here is I'm moving the mass formula from one side to the other. 
And maybe that'll become a little more clear when I sketch the proof. Um, now, um, there's a corollary. If, if H is one, so if the class number of the genus is one, then you have a very nice statement because it just says that um, two, L, two solutions are uh, equivalent over Z if and only if they're equivalent over ZP for all P. So that, that really is a quantitative version of the, um, or a, a, a refinement of the Hassel principle. So XX prime in C of S are equivalent. So I, li I like this statement a lot. Um, I would say more, but equivalent to some more. Same Z orbit, if only if we are in the same ZP orbit. Well, P. Um, I have one more question. Does it uh, realize as a zero Fourier coefficient of Eisenstein series? If we look at the Ziegels. Uh... Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I I'll have to think about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Yeah, let me, let me think about it. Maybe it'll pop into my head. Um, uh, so, I want to give you some examples of this. So first of all, the, you, you, you get nice examples just with the Legendre equation, with the diagonal equation. So if, if you take the case that's used in the proof of the Hasse principle, so if you assume A, B, and C are A times B times C is square free, And it's isotropic. Let me just always assume that. Then um, the class number is one and the number of orbits is one. So I'll give you some indication at the end how this is, how this is proved. I mean, you can compute the right-hand side of the theorem um, in different ways, but you can also do this by reduction. And this includes the case of the Pythagorean triples, and that's kind of an old theorem from the 30s. But as far as I know, people haven't really looked at this question much in general. Um, if, if you take a more general case of Legendre theorem, which over the rationals, these are not interesting questions because everything's equivalent. So it's really over the integers that the, and the orbit question is really an integral question. If you think about it. So this is a case where you don't have square freeness. And in this case, if Q is a product of prime, of distinct primes, distinct primes congruent to three mod four, then you can prove it's a classical result of Meyer that the class number is one, but the number of orbits is not in this case. It's the product of p minus one over two over the primes. So the, 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 it's not always true that there's one orbit. I mean, you could think that that might be true, but that's definitely not true. And also the class number is not always one, even though it often is. If you have simple S's, usually the class number is one, but when you have uh, high powers of primes dividing the coefficients, it's often that it's not usually true that the class number is one. So another case would be if the Q, if the Q is prime, uh, product of primes, distinct, which are congruent to one mod eight. And also if you have the condition that they're <clears throat> all quadratic residues of each other, which is kind of an interesting condition. So the P quadratic residues of each other. Then you have a pretty big class number. A H is two to the number of primes. Class number is always a power of two. This is a theorem of 
Meyer and then uh, Knazer actually worked on this much later and, and gave much more general nice results. But uh, the class number is always a power of two. And in this case, the number of orbits of each of each S in, in the genus is all the same. It's P minus one over four product of P divided two. So the, well, basically lots of different things can happen here. I just wanted to illustrate that. And I'll, I'll, at the end, if I have time, I'll tell you how, how you actually prove these from, I, I, yeah, it's actually better not to use the theorem to prove these. In fact, there's a different approach that you can use, a somewhat more elementary approach. Okay, so what really led me, I, this question of Ziegel is what led me to this problem, but also I was motivated by a proof of Ziegel's theorem that was due to, to Eskin, Rudnick, and Sarnak from many years ago, where they they used a, an idea of comparing asymptotic counts in an orbit to asymptotic count of, the, of all solutions. So I wanted to see if you could apply that method to this problem and, some, and somehow get some substitute for Ziegel's theorem. And that's really what happened. Um, so, but you need to know, first of all, you need to know the mass formula. You can't get around this. So this is part of it. And to formulate this, one very beautiful circumstance here is that if I take the um, group of automorphs, so these are the things that came into the orbit. So these are just the transformations that leave S alone. So this is a nice group of subgroup of the orthogonal group of S. Um, now, if I think of it as being in the, ortho the orthogonal group over R, it has a subgroup, um, which is what you get when you restrict everything in, in O of S to the connected component of the identity of the special orthogonal group. So that's, that turns out to be the, the group that you want to look at. So it's the spinner group, group. And this turns out to be isomorphic to a Fuchsian group acting on the upper half plane. This is the entry of analysis for me into this. And there's different ways you can do this, but this is a Fuchsian group. So a subgroup of SL2R, a PSL2R. And it's cofinite. And this is due to Fricka Klein um, originally, I, I think, although you know, instances of it were known even all the way back to Gauss. But there's an explicit um, map that you can write down, which I actually need, but that, that tells you how to go from an element in O plus S to, I, did, I didn't write down what this is, but this, again, it's, it's the subgroup kind of in the connected component of the identity. Um, and this, this group has many nice properties. For example, it has cusps if and only if S is isotropic. But it's always cofinite, and the volume, so this is the volume, hyperbolic volume of H mod gamma S. So that's finite as well. And that's what enters into the mass formula. So the mass formula compares the sum of the volumes over the genus to a product of local densities and the local densities of the are the local densities of the orthogonal group restricted to ZP. So there's lots of local densities that show up here. So this is Eagle's theorem. So you compute the number of um, elements in the orthogonal group over the piatics mo taken modulo p to the m. So you can think of this as um, counting solutions to a congruence by p to the m. This op so op of s is the I'm, I'm not going to write out the definition. So this is the zp version of the orthogonal. 
uh, but anyway, so you count the number of solutions modulo PM and then divide by P to the 3M and take this limit. And, and it's a result of Ziegel that it stabilizes. So this gives you a, a rational number. Um, and, and then you take, and the product is actually convergent. So when you take the product over here, um, this is actually convergent. And gamma infinity is the corresponding thing for infinity and it's explicit. Gamma delta, delta infinity. In this case is pi over 4D squared. There's lots of little subtleties that it, you have to deal with in dealing with the subject because for example, Ziegel uses volume on the orthogonal group and the volume on the Fuchsian group is is um, twice his volume. And there's all kinds of little things that have to match up exactly. So it's kind of a, it's a, it can be quite a tricky, tricky thing to, to deal with Ziegel's theorems. Okay, so what, what are the asymptotics I'm talking about? Well, one of them is really well known. So one of them is counting all the, um, <clears throat> all the points X in primitive solutions uh, with some restriction on their size. There's infinitely many, so you have to put some restriction on the size. But the usual way to do this is to use a norm. And, and what you're really doing is you're counting rational points on a conic. So this is a special case of a very general set of theorems uh, due to Franca, uh, Manin, and Schinkel, and also um, Pear, who counted, um, who, who gave the constants in the asymptotic. What I needed to do was not to use the norm, but a slight variation. So to describe this, I'll let S star be the ad, adjunct of S. So this is just the determinant of S. It's basically the inverse made integral. So I take the inverse and multiply by the determinant. And if I take a, a Y in R3 so that this adjunct form has the value four times the, the determinant, which is positive, then there's only finitely many um, solutions that have an inner product between X and Y. So Y is general with this condition, and that turns out to be important. It's that it's general, but so this would be the X's for which uh, the inner product of X and Y is between zero and T say. Now this is finite. Um, and even though this condition is, you're, you're talking about something lying between two planes and, but you can see that it's finite with this condition because basically what you're doing is you're taking the lattice points that lie, you're cutting this cone. The, the, the condition that S is zero is a cone. And what you're doing is you're cutting the cone in an ellipse instead of a hyperbola. So you, you get, my picture is pretty bad here, but you're counting points on the cone between two planes that cut it so that it's a compact set. And what their theorem implies is that this has an asymptotic formula. Not only is it finite, but it has an asymptotic formula. And so what is it? What's the constant? It's a product of local, of local densities again. So it's one half, there's a density of infinity, product of sigma p's. And these, these sigma uh, p's are the local density for counting the solutions. It's sort of the natural thing. So this is an actually pretty non-trivial theorem, in, in fact, um, especially if you approach it from the point of view of the Hardy, Hardy Littlewood circle method, which is where this kind of asymptotic was first given. It's given for usually for quadratic forms and many variables, in which case you're getting Gauss sums and these products of local densities converge nicely. So I've, I've introduced some notation, which I haven't defined. This CP of S are the solutions, uh, the piatic solutions. So I'll, I'll just, I won't write that down, but th that's what they are. It's sort of the net, everything's kind of natural here, which you'd expect. But again, this is non-trivial because we're talking about ternary forms and the 
the Hardy Littlewood method becomes difficult because very difficult actually to do it directly uh, because you get non-convergent um, products. So there's there there are ways around it. Heath Brown found a very nice um, way to deal with the um, product of local densities in the ternary case when you have weights. So I won't go into this, but you can prove this. There's this. There's several different proofs that you could give of this. There's the original proof of um, Franca, Chinko, and, and Menin, and, and Pear. But you can also give a sort of a more classical proof, but it's it's highly non-trivial. Um, OK, so the new thing that I did was to try to do the corresponding count when you're restricting to an orbit. So if I, let's, if I take a, a fixed x, um, which is a solution, and I define the, the orbit of it, which is what basically what we defined before. So these are the, the points in here, which are in the image of something in the orthogonal, in the um, group of automorphs. So just basically what we did before. And we also have a local version of this. So we have this local orthogonal group. Well, it's it's the isotropy group. So this is this. I have to look at the the group, the subgroup of the of the automorphs that fix this point X. So this is the difference here. So some. Then we could define local the local densities. So I'll call it delta p because it's really part of the um, group of automorphs. So again, it's sort of the obvious thing. You have to get all the little constants in front, right? So again, you take the number of points in the isotropy group modulo p to the m, and then you compute that. That's a finite number. It's a group, finite group. And then you take the limit. And again, this stabilizes. OK, so what is the theorem? So again, it, s is going to be isotropic. And I'll fix this y, which is going to give me the norm type thing. Then it, for a fixed x in a fixed solution, we can count the points in the orbit. of x, little x, um, with this con constraint on the size. And again, this is asymptotic to a constant times t. And let me write down what the constant is. It does involve the volume. And then it involves the product of the local densities of the isotropy subgroup. Inverted. And this actually converges. And for most P, it's it's easy to see. These are actually powers of P, except for primes that don't divide two times the discriminant. So it's actually pretty, pretty simple in some sense um, how these what these look like. Not so simple to compute them exactly, but um, there's no problem with convergence of the of the product over primes can be given. And in fact, let me let me write down the finite. Well, no, I won't. 
Okay, so anyway, this this is the orbital asymptotic. And, you know, this I, I view this kind of as the main theorem for me. Um, this is the hardest thing to prove. The, the thing that's hard to prove is not that there is an asymptotic, but to compute the constant. This is actually turns out to be kind of kind of challenging thing to do. Uh, and it's what you need to prove the first theorem. And everything has to be exactly right. No, and factors of two, the bane of the number theorists show up in every way you can imagine here. So it's a, uh, anyway, the, that's the, the key result. And for me anyway, that's the, the, key, the key result. So you, what you can, you can ask questions about this. You can say, what about um, the constant? Does it change as the orbit changes or, or are the, uh, is the distribution uniform across orbits? And the answer is sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. I, for the examples that I wrote down earlier, it, it turns out that they are all the same, but you can come up with examples where they're not all the same. So it's kind of an interesting question, which I haven't looked at in detail, as to understand, you know, more in terms of S, how the orbits themselves are distributed. Okay, but for here, I'm going to concentrate on how you can use this to prove uh, the, the, the main theorem about counting um, orbits. Uh, what's the error term in T? I didn't, I, I didn't compute it. it what this does is it comes from uh, counting uh, orbits of an Eisenstein series. So if you know something about the poles of the Eisenstein series, you know you can you can definitely give um, uh, error estimate. It's it, the group is an arithmetic group, but I I don't think it's congruent subgroup. So um, what I use is I use a gen general result about Eisenstein series, the meromorphicity. Uh, that's another interesting question, which I haven't, but I haven't looked at this. I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating mostly on the constant. Okay, so a corollary of this, which is, is where the mass formula comes in, is, is the sum over the orbits. So if we sum uh, over the orbits... Sorry, orbit, uh, Peter, can I ask a question? You say it's oh, not Peter. a congruence group, but I assume that that's because you went to the spin group, and then yeah. it's metaplectic con congruence, I guess. In other words, I don't think it's sort of fundamentally non-congruence just in terms of the poles. That's okay. my guess. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that would mean that you could you could definitely give a good error term. Right, I, I think so, probably. Yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, also, uh, Igor um, asked in the chat, it should be X uh, dash Y T in... Uh, 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 where here? Yes. Here. Yes. So that's just an inner product, right? Um, these are vectors. So that's the that's a dot product of the vectors. Uh, yes, but if you're looking at x. You call it x prime. Oh, x prime. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fine. Yeah, my writing is pretty bad. Sorry, but. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, so X is fixed and then everything depends on X. All right, so what you can do here then is, is sum up over the orbits and you, you are going to get, first of all, you're going to get an identity because you have these two different asymptotics. So when you sum over the orbits, one way to write the corollary is a formula for the volume. So there's different ways you could write this, but one way is to write it as a formula for the volume, which is kind of kind of nice because it doesn't involve summing over the genus, but it involves summing over the orbits. And the local density is product is actually a finite product if you write it this way. <clears throat> and then this also involves this sigma from the first asymptotic. Okay, so that's kind of a nice little formula. By the way, I, I didn't do this, but I think you could play around with this with the um, Gauss-Bonnet formula <clears throat> to try to say something more about the, the structure of the group because <clears throat> we basically the number of orbits is the number of cusps of this group. And um, 
the volume in the Gaspinet formula also relates the number of cusps and all, and the number of points of finite order. So it might be kind of interesting to use this to say something more about the geometry of the group. I, I haven't done that really. <clears throat> okay, now to get to the, uh, to use this in order to count orbits, you need to relate the isotropy group and the size of the group to the size of the orbits, but that's something you can do. So um, how, how I say this, I, I won't write down the definition, but you can um, you can probably extrapolate what they should be. So I can talk about the ZP orbits and their densities. I'm being a little bit imprecise here, but then you can use the orbit stabilizer theorem to relate to relate these on a, on a finite level. So this will give you an identity between these local densities. So here's basically the sizes of the orbits, the, P, the ZP orbits, and the size of the group, the, the whole group, divided by the um, size of the isotropy subgroup. So this varies with X. That's gonna tell you the size of the orbits. And, and that's what the uh, other, the first asymptotic really did for you, it, it related, the count and the of all the solutions to the sizes of the orbit of the of the sum of the orbits, right? So by combining these, then you get you can get a statement which allows you to compare um, the orbits, the, the sizes of the local orbits and the global orbit. So to see, but we still have this problem with the fact that the genus consists of several classes. This is a headache that you can't get rid of. So, but there's only finitely many, so let me list them. So I'll take representatives of the genus. And then I'll take orbit representatives for each of these guys. Uh, okay, so what you can then get from this, and this is a, not an immediate corollary, but um, is that if you take the product of the um, sigma p's from the from the full as asymptotic, then I can relate that to the sum over the over the genus, and then a sum over the orbit representatives. This is little c, um, and then the product of the local densities of the local orbits. Okay, so that's what comes out from the um, uh, these two asymptotic formulas. And that's the thing that's useful for proving the, the first theorem. Now, these the one of the problems that arises is when you're doing the, the 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 local orbits, they can they 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 include solutions to your s s of x equal to zero. They're simply local solutions. But the theorem the the main theorem sit, was talking about global solutions and their local representatives. So you have to know that every local solution actually comes from a global solution to to use this. And for that, I, I learned this from um, Reiner Schulze Pilot, who helped me with this because he he was able to show that you can deduce this from a theorem of Knazer in Knazer's book on quadratic forms. But it, he, you have to translate his theorem into, for me anyway, into the language of forms. And also his theorem is about representations um, of, of one lattice into another, but that translates nicely into, the, into representations 
of an integer by quadratic forms. Uh, it, and the, the um, advantage of that approach is that it doesn't require that you look at different uh, classes in the genus. It combines all the classes of a genus into one thing. So what he, what he explained to me is that um, what, the, what theorem, the first theorem actually is equivalent to is a statement that um, representations of zero uh, that fall into, into genera. And that's, that theorem says that each genus consists of one class of representations. I, this is only for people who really know the subject already, but uh, that's what I was able, I was able to then apply um, that theorem of Knazer together with this result to get theorem one. Now, the way I actually did it was to go to, for, instead of having p-adic densities, to actually go to counting solutions to congruences. And so that's, that's actually what I did. Um, Anyway, so you know, if you're interested in this, I, I put a, a preprint on, on my website and you can see more details of this. Okay, now I do wanna say something about what's involved in the proof of this theorem here, uh, because it's, to me, it was kind of, kind of fun. Um, so again, we use the Eisenstein series. Okay, but there's a subtlety that happens because how are you going to get these product of um, local densities of isotropy groups from the Eisenstein series? So, well, the volume is natural because that comes from uh, the, the uh, residue of the pole of the Eisenstein series at one. That, that just shows up very naturally. But these guys maybe don't. Maybe they do, maybe if somebody knows how to do that, you know, immediately. But the way I did it was to actually compute um, the, first of all, you do a reduction of your S. So S being isotropic has a nice, has a nice effect. So I can, I can basically do a reduction on it and make it be equivalent to another S, which has a simple form. So first of all, I can put zero here because it's isotropic. You can also make these, these terms zero, and then you get this nice form. So this is basically Gauss, where a, b and, a, a and B are positive integers and C and D can be not, they can be, they're integers. But what this is doing at the level of the group is you're taking X, which is the solution to the equation. You can think of this as representing a cusp. And what it's doing is it's taking that cusp to infinity this this change it's really a change of variables which takes the cusp to infinity, and this has a nice result that you can compute the parabolic subgroup. And at infinity, of course, it looks like this. There's some positive kappa. So this to the n. And the problem is to compute this kappa depending on s. And kappa depends on A, B, C, and D. And this is the fun part. So that's where the relation to the local isotropy group comes in. So what you do is you use the explicit isomorphism to compute kappa. And let me tell you what it is. So kappa turns out to be square root of B. This B is in this reduced guy. And there's an integer F. And this is where F is minimal in Z plus such that I realize I'm running out of time here. So it involves A, B, and C. So this is an integer. Now this this come it's called a natural. So this is you compute the pair you compute the group element that corresponds to the parabolic transformation. And then the, the to be in our Fuchsian group means that the entries have to be integral. And that turns out to be this condition. These are integers. Um, and, and so then what you have to do is you have to compute the isotropy group of this special guy. 
And by taking the cusp to infinity, the point um, is simple. It's one, zero, zero. And then you actually compute the, you count the number of points in the isotropy group modulo p to the m. And for the different primes, everything is related to a, b, c, and f. You know, because they actually compute the isotropy group, you look at, you look at S1 of x equal to um, x, and you write down what the, you write down actually, no, I'm saying this wrong. You have to, you have to take the transformation of, of S1 by an element in your group and count the number of elements in the group modulo p to the m. And I was quite amazed that it actually worked out because everything depends on a, b, c, a, b, and c, and these change over the orbits. But um, it, it actually works out perfectly when you do this, um, which tells me there's probably a um, much easier proof in the background because usually when a, there's a highly computational proof and usually when a highly computational proof works out beautifully for no apparent, no apparent reason, then there's something behind it, which is making it work. And I suspect somebody will find this and tell me about it at some point. Anyway, so just before I stop, I had to do this for P equal to two, which those of you who have experience with Ziegel's theorem know that that's something that's usually not done for good reason. But here it's actually not so bad. It, it turned out it was quite doable. And again, everything worked out perfectly for the theorem. So one last thing to get the examples. My my original approach to this was was element. My original approach was like this, but in a special case. But then I I did a, an elementary approach, which is to take this reduction further, and actually get an elementary proof of the theorem. But it only works for special s. But those special s are actually the ones in the example. So you can, they can actually be derived by an elementary method, which is just taking the reduction technique further. Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll stop there.